It's Jay Stone Go, Gary Fife, Joho Jeff Giddos. Uh, welcome to the program this week, folks. We've got a couple of things to share. We've had a whole lot of things happening on the political scene and uh, uh, issues facing our, uh, our principal our nation, actually, and our principal chief, James Floyd, is here today to talk about those somewhat and give us kind of an update on what's going on and where we may be headed. I guess to start off our discussion here, do you want to kind of give us a state of the nation uh, real quick, the status where... Short state of the nation, yeah. mid-year state of the nation, I yeah, guess. Um, well, it's been a very busy and I believe productive year so far. Um, you know, I'll give a quarterly report to the National Council this Saturday. And, um, you know, we've made great progress in health care, in education, uh, the permanent fund is doing well. Um, programs are meeting the objectives they set um, in the beginning of the year. And so, you know, using those measures um, and reporting those to all of our citizens, you know, they can quickly see that, you know, it, it's work, but we're making um, progress. Um, and um, I, I believe that we're on a path that we'll continue to do that. Uh, now we've just finished the third quarter, so in um, October um, we'll be presenting, you know, the kind of the year-end report. So um, with our staff, the things that we'll be doing on is working on the objectives for 2019. It'll be a little bit different, and I think the difference is, is it's kind of like um, you scratch the surface in the first year, you kind of scratch the surface and you look at all the things that you need to kind of correct. and and uh, realign, and, you know, in the second year, you began to put some measures in place, or in the third year, we really got more detail on the measures, and I think that um, we'll see that again next year. And um, so that will be more detail. So we just keep getting digger and digging deeper and deeper into things, and um, we need to measure them so that we know that we're making progress. And so, um, is in terms of the state of the nation, I think we're doing well, um, and we're poised to even do a lot more things, and that may be some of the things that's occupying so much of my time right now. We got plenty of opportunities. I'll put it that way. Certainly, um, I have to. I think personally agree with you. I've heard nothing but progress for, for the most part. Uh, one little fly in the ointment that we uh, we picked up on the end of last week was a situation in Ufala where three top officials were uh, arrested and charged with taking uh, tribal funds without, you know, proper authority, in other words. Uh, the word embezzlement comes to mind, but I've not seen it in any of the court documents or any discussions in your press releases or anything else. So maybe we can take a second and kind of fill us in. Uh, our uh, Facebook notice on that particular story has over 20,000 hits on it. So well, people were well, it, love controversy, I guess. But well, I appreciate them having the interest in the in the business of the communities. Um, and I guess my appreciation is is that we're not going to tolerate things where people go out of bounds and they break the law. There's consequences for that, and you know it's the tribe's money, and there could be federal money involved, and in, you know and that personally, you know, hurts me because you know having been a former former federal employee, you don't do that. There's consequences there as well, and so. I think that um, you know we've had this occur a couple places now, and we're acting on it. Um, I think for those people that are affected, they may not like that, but they chose the behavior that they've followed, and um, this is the consequence. Now, let me distinguish, distinguish between my role and the role of others in this um, issue. My role um, is to address the problem that lies within the executive branch. You know, we have oversight over the communities, community research and development does. And so, you know, I signed the order to place the Fala Indian community uh, under proclamation. So, you know, now we basically manage the Fala Indian community um, as something that we don't take lightly. We don't really want to do that. 
And you took the step of revoking their charter? We hold their charter kind of in, in abeyance, in a sense. They will still follow those things. It's just that our staff will be presiding over the meetings. And I think there's a meeting tomorrow night, I believe, the regular meeting. Um, you know, and we control basically everything that was controlled by these individuals of the officers of the community before. Um, and in this case, so that was my role. In this case, it was also investigated through the Attorney General's office and their investigation team and resulted in charges and arrests. And that's serious. Um, and I hate to see that with our own citizens. But at the same time, we have to be um, very um, good stewards of the resources that we have. The National Council invests money into these communities and, and so they have to comply. And um, so um, I think the path forward there at Ufala is um, you know, continue to monitor, monitor that. Um, you know, the court system will work its, you know, this case will work its way through the court system, I'll put it that way. Um, and that will be uh, the Muskogee District Court? Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, tribal District Court. And, um, you know, I don't control the court. I don't control the Attorney General's office. So, you know, those work independently of the executive branch. Um, so at this point, as I said, you know, my role is basically to, uh, to put them under proclamation and, and to um, manage the community till such time as, you know, things can be repaired, uh, systems put back into place where there's accountability, uh, new officers who will be accountable, and um, then we'll monitor that and then, uh, you know, then release that. The length of time, I don't know. So uh, that's the extent that, you know, I'm involved in that. Right. Okay, well, it is a sorry kind of story we have to tell, but that's something we have to deal with. Um, a couple of other things, uh, maybe, I know these aren't exactly where, uh, you know, your uh, responsibilities might lie. Uh, a uh, quick update, uh, Royal B. Murphy. Now, I understand, of course, the Attorney General's office is pretty much uh, running that show. Uh, anything you, you can share with us on that? Well, the um, Royal versus Murphy case, <clears throat> excuse me, as it presently stands, you know, that's a um, capital murder um, case of um, appeal of a death sentence. And so, you know, the tribe is um, a party to that in um, that um, you know we're we're supporting the appeal because it deals with the sovereignty of the nation, and um, so it's. I think a lot of people think, well, it's a Creek Nation case. It's really not a Creek Nation case. It's an individual who's a defendant, and who's been convicted and who's in prison, and facing a death sentence, and so it's that appeal. Um, of the Murphy case that's, um, you know, going before the Supreme Court. And um, so um, that's, you know, will take its own course. And um, so uh, I know it's garnered a lot of attention and will continue to do that. Anytime you're before the Supreme Court, you're going to be a high profile case. Right now, um, it hasn't gone anywhere, essentially, but uh, is the tribe kind of uh, looking at preparations in case it does go through and it goes in favor of the nation, uh, looking at possible recruiting more police, uh, things like that? Um, no, I guess I'll put it that way, okay. because and I think that's where the speculation um, exceeds the case. And then that's where the talk, you know, kind of has no boundary, so to speak. So you hear everything from you know, civil cases to, you know, law enforcement. Um, but when you distill this case down, it's basically an appeal of a death sentence, and that's a capital crime. And so um, that's really what the case is about. And so in that regard, we don't see anything changing in regard to the nation, uh, especially anything overnight. And I think that's been the misnomer of the case, is that hey, everything's going to change. And, um, but we'll let that go before the Supreme Court, make the arguments that the um, 
the defender will make, and um, we'll see where that goes. Well, let's shift to, uh, we, in the recent uh, days, we've heard uh, a suit by the uh, Freedmen has been filed. Uh, they're saying that the treaty has pretty much guaranteed them the rights as citizens and that uh, the nation has been denying them that. So uh, what happens now? Uh, does your administration assemble uh, your AG and other people to go to court for that one? Uh, what's the discussion there? Um, you know, I've not, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, we've not, um, I've not read it. I don't think that, the tribe's even seen that yet. Um, so, you know, I, I don't even know what's in it. <clears throat> um, I know that I've had conversations with different groups um, over since I've been in the office, and, you know, my role as principal chief is to uphold the constitution of the Muscogee Creek Nation. And um, so any individual who can try their, uh, t tie their lineage back to the final roles of the Dawes Commission and uh, be Creek by blood, they're welcome to be citizens. It, it's been that way and it remains that way today. So um, I'm not sure where they're coming from. I, I, at this time, it's just so premature. I, I, like I said, I've not even seen it, read it. Sure. Uh, and so um, if, that, if it's true and it does come to pass, then uh, we will, um, you know, get attorneys on that, and then, you know, we'll see how that proceeds as well. Sure. It might be worth a little chat with the Cherokees on that one, huh? Well, maybe, maybe not. And, you know, I think what some people get confused about in the Treaty of 1866 following the Civil War is that there was one treaty and applied to the five civilized tribes. There were five individual treaties. Each one was worded a little differently. So, um, you, we can't say that the Treaty of 1866 was one document, you know, the five chiefs and the, I mean, four chiefs and the governor signed that. Um, they were all individually negotiated and it took a, a number of months before all five tribes signed. And I think in the order, Muscogee Creek was fourth of the five tribes. So, you know, just, um, again, it gets to where the speculation kind of um, exceeds the issue, and then and I think people need to come back and if they want more education about that, read about the treaties of 1866, right. as opposed to the Treaty of 1866. Um, let's do one more legal question here and we'll try and move on to something a, a little more enlightening. Uh, the Indian Health Service suit, uh, you sued to uh, uh, have them pay back some of the shortcomings that they had uh, stuck us with and uh, failed in full funding. Is that pretty much done? Will the, uh, the IHS be paying the trial? Um, I feel confident that we'll prevail on that case. Um, the the um, statistics and, and the numbers are, are in black and white. Um, I think it's a failure by the Indian Health Service to, to pay what they should have. Um, what uh, in this case is gone on for a number of years. Um, I think back to about 2009. Um, I think in the last couple of years what we've done is made sure that we corrected everything that needed to be corrected and updated the calculations that um, we use in negotiations with the Indian Health Service. Uh, I believe they recognize that. I think um, so, you know, in that regard I feel confident um, but, you know, I was probably the most reluctant individual to um, sue the Indian Health Service because that was my former employer for <laughs> over 10 years. So, you know, I know those people and um, had talks with them and said, look, it's, how could you avoid this? Because um, it's right in front of you. But um, that's their choice. And so, you know, again, in my role as the principal chief, I have to look out for the good of the nation, and so we had to file this because we are owed. And um, you know, we'll see where this goes. I feel confident we'll get the money that we need, and um, and that will help us. And so yeah, we'll I think a lot of citizens are glad that this is this is moving along, and it looks good. They're, they're glad to hear that 
we can get some recompense from uh, from the federal government. You know, you mentioned your 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 situation, kind of biting the hand that feeds you. Um, uh, I was I've been in a similar situation for long, you know, years and years of journalist in Alaska, and all of a sudden I was working for the utility company as the PIO. <clears throat> Former colleagues now are firing questions at me, and I had to hold them off with at arm's length and come up with an answer. I thought that they would believe because since they really knew me so yeah all of a sudden uh, sympathetic pangs there kind of popped up but a couple of things here that we were uh, made aware of one uh, you had some positive uh, uh, um, news uh, some some time uh, back uh, on developments with a tribe one of them being the country club and we have uh, now some direction some some idea of where that's going uh, maybe you could uh, bring us up today sure be glad to you know, we have the master plan that um, uh, has four parts to that here in the Omogi area. Um, the tribal complex, 40-acre parcel is included in the master plan, the omniplex, the industrial site uh, north of town, and um, then the country club. So um, the National Council is very supportive in, in, in um, giving us resources to um, contract with a group that um, did the design, did the studies, and prepared us um, so that we could go out and um, make the decisions on the priority of going forth on the uh, master plan. Um, and I think at this point, you know, we're looking at how we finance it. Um, what is the um, least costly way to obtain resources to to undertake? you know, the plan um, and working out the finer details. You know, we, you mentioned the country club building itself. It's on the state and national register of historic places. And um, so, you know, our plan there is to restore that to the 1920 uh, style that it was when it was built. It will be a revenue stream for the nation. We will use that to um, have, you know, showings that will be open to the public. Uh, they can rent that. Um, it has a number of aspects to that that are very favorable to the nation. The cost of renovation is really not that expensive for that. But, um, you know, the master plan goes on to look at um, and, and lay out that area becoming the cultural center uh, for the nation, house cultural preservation and office buildings that we would build and things like that and to bring people to that area so they can see our cultural culture um, both living and the, the things that we have stored. And um, so we will have other buildings besides that but the country club building itself will be restored and, and we hope will be a su very successful venture. Uh, we, we know there's, there, the demand is there People want to hold receptions and, and rent that out. So if we could rent it out every day, I'd be happy. That would be great. We'd get it restored. Um, the other aspect of it, as I mentioned, is just prioritizing things. Um, we know the complex buildings, some of them are uh, at least 40 years old now. Uh, they've really come to the end of their useful life. And so um, the master plan really looks at basically rebuilding the tribal complex, um, bringing in, uh, having the capacity to bring in programs that are now in rented space throughout Old Mulgee and have them in central location, um, have it built in a way that um, uh, shows our culture and in a way that provides more efficiency um, in buildings that are more cost efficient than we have right now. And so it makes a lot of sense. We just need to put, um, you know, get the financing structure in place and then decide which parts uh, go first. 